What if you could buy Apple? 80% off. How much money are you gonna make on that long term? This is, is going to be the first time that we have an economic event of, of this scale that is global. Well, I'm gonna take some part of my portfolio and I'm gonna bet on stocks going down. The last time that gold uh, took a dip under a thousand, you couldn't get any physical, and if you did, you were paying more for it than if, if you had bought it when it was 1100. You can do stuff now to be ahead of this and be positioned right when this happened, because this is inevitable. You cannot keep a bubble going forever, and you cannot prevent deflation forever. You can't save it off forever. When it happens, like you said earlier, a small percentage of people are going to make a fortune and do very well, and most people are just going to not know what hit them. Several months ago, we did an interview with Harry Dent in our offices in Santa Monica. And now that the episode of Hidden Secrets of Money that is about deflation, episode six, uh, is coming out, we wanted to come to Florida and visit Harry in his office and do a little bit of a follow-up on that. So Harry, um, we both feel that there's definitely going to be deflation. I believe there's going to be deflation before a big inflation or hyperinflation simply because our monetary system can't function under deflation for long periods right. of time. It starts to implode because of the interest owed on every dollar in existence. So um, uh, what are the, the fundamental reasons that you think deflation has to happen? I mean, I, you, you went over demographics already in, in the office, so we don't have to do too much demographics. But um, I see uh, that we are headed for a bond crisis and a currency crisis. Uh, I think that the dollar will go up first. Mm -hmm. But then I think that we're headed for a real currency crisis, that uh, there's going to be something a little bit different this time. Well, you know, the, the history is crystal clear on this. Deflation is rare. An economy cannot stay in deflation for long. Deflation always follows major debt bubbles. And what happens in a debt bubble is that not only does debt grow and leverage the economy and create unsustainable growth, but most importantly, debt creates more money that chases financial assets. It's not just a bubble mm -hmm. in debt. It always ends up with a financial asset bubble. And, and a lot of people have been looking for, you know, and, and governments are keeping this bubble going and they're, they're printing money like unbelievable. And people say, why don't we get inflation? The inflation is coming in the financial assets. Stocks are going up for no good reason. The Chinese stock market just doubled in less than a year when they just announced that their exports dropped 15% of last year. That, that is death for China. China's economy has been doing nothing but slowing. Their real estate bubble's finally going down. And, and yet the stock market doubles. Why? Because the money's got to go somewhere. And so that's what central banks have engineered. We, we had a natural bubble. Debt grew at two and a half times, 2.6 times actually, GDP from 1983 to 2008. Now, th that's obviously unsustainable. So that debt bubble was starting to implode and financial assets with it. And you saw major financial institutions about to go under and governments just stepped in and said, well, we're not gonna let this happen. We're gonna inflate to offset the deflation. So this is how you get deflation. I call it, you can create money by magic. That's what banks do. Governments can print it like magic, which they're doing now with QE. Uh, it is like magic. Now you see it, but also now you don't. This money can disappear even faster than it was created. Because when the debt bubble burst, a lot of debts go bad, get written off or restructured, just like Chapter 7 yeah. or Chapter 11 in business when that happens. But more important than that, there's more money than debt in financial assets that have been overinflated by quantitative easing. And this natural, we had a natural bubble, now we have an artificial bubble because the governments are trying to keep a bubble going forever. And I'm like, who can do that? And the answer is nobody. You can't right. keep a bubble going forever. These financial assets implode like they did in 2008 before they stopped it, like they did in the, in the early 1930s. Stocks went down 89% and did not go back to those highs for 24 years. Housing went down like 30% and didn't get back to those highs for 10 years. So these assets not only implode, they, 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 they go down and they don't come roaring back to new highs. That destroys wealth. There is, uh, I saw something the other day, major global study, $250 trillion in financial assets, loans, stocks, bonds, you name it, 
that have been inflated by this global mm -hmm. bubble. Out of that 250, I look at history. In the Great Depression, 60% of, of private debt was washed out uh, as a percentage of GDP because of that deflation. So let's say that $100 trillion of that 250, that'd be my best estimate. It might be more than that. By history, $100 trillion at least will disappear, mostly stock value and loans. Well, when all that money disappears, you got less money chasing the same goods. That's the classic right. definition of deflation. So that, that's how even though governments are printing money, all the money printed, QE, 11, 12 trillion by different estimates up to this point, that doesn't compare to that 100 trillion that could disappear like that in a matter of years. So that's how you get deflation. You bubble up, debt creates money, banks lend against 10% of your deposits. They lend as they, they borrow money, they create money as if it's their deposit. It's your deposit. And that's what happens in the Great Depression. Banks lent money to, to housing, but largely to farms and farm equipment. That was the big bubble there. It was a tractor bubble back then. And when those loans went bad in the mm -hmm. banks, they didn't have your money. So that's how you get a bank run. Money's created out of thin air at high leverage, 10 to 1 in banks. Uh, and, and now, again, we've never seen this before. Outside of World War II, governments have never just printed trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. But those bubbles burst, the debt bubble and the financial asset bubble, and that's how you get deflation. And, and, but the deflation wipes out a lot of debt, wipes out a lot of those excesses, so deflation doesn't last that long, and then you go back to an inflationary economy. We've had basically inflation for 90-some percent of the time for all of modern history. As well, long as you have population yes, growing and standard of living growing and stuff, inflation's actually a about natural 34, phenomenon. Yeah. yeah. But the difference is once in a lifetime, you get more of a hyperinflation like we saw in the 70s, and once in a lifetime, you get a deflation. So my biggest thing about deflation, it's hard to explain to people, especially when governments are printing so much money, people just naturally think that's got to cause inflation. All it has done is offset the deflation we would have already had and kept inflation between zero and two percent mm -hmm. in most countries. When so so they don't understand deflation because they haven't seen it. But if you look at history, it's very simple. It follows debt in financial yeah. asset bubbles. Very simple. And, and, and like you say, it's temporary. The last time around, though, um, about, about a third of our currency supply, and I don't call it money because it's credit is our currency supply yeah. today. Um, a third of our currency supply back then or, or greater was uh, actually, there was a 40% reserve ratio by the Fed, but then you've got bank credit. But about a third of the currency supply was uh, gold. That, so you had this component that could not evaporate. It was exactly. still there regardless of what happened. Uh, this time around, there's nothing, it's all credit. All credit. There's, there is nothing solid underneath this. And, and so credit has a counterparty risk. And it requires faith that uh, your counterparty is going to pay you for the system to keep on working. It's a confidence game. The other thing about credit, uh, Mike, is that as, as we move forward, as we get richer, wealthier, more affluent, and we are, we're eight times our standard of living from 1900. Um, so as people get more affluent, they can borrow much more. In the 1920s, the average person couldn't borrow to buy a home. It was a five-year mortgage. Um, and, and you had to put 50% down, and it's kind of like that in China today. So not only is our economy credit, we have created way more credit than we did in the last financial mm -hmm. bubble, which peaked in 1929, and of course that was followed by what? The Great Depression. You might as well call it the Great Deflation. That's what it was. It's, right. It was a great deflation, but that deflation cleared the decks, took a lot of debt off of businesses and, and people, took all these, I mean, how, how is a, is a younger family going to invest for retirement when stocks are so highly valued? I, the best stock models say at the valuation stocks are at today, you would expect minus 1% return over the next decade. How do you invest for the future? How do, you, how do you have a decent standard of living when housing got so expensive? And, and I mean, I, I used to live in San Francisco before here. I mean, a starter home, a crappy starter home was $800,000 there. How does a young family have a standard of living when, when 50, 60 percent of their salary goes to the mortgage and property taxes? So this great deflation is a reset. It's a good thing. We, we, we get all, all this excess and we get mm -hmm. back to a level. It, it lowers this, the cost of living and then we go back to inflation. That happens every time. Inflation follows deflation. 
You talked about the potential of maybe a hundred trillion, trillion vanishing. <clears throat> um, if you look at the 20s, the, the percentage of the population that was leveraged with debt was much lower than much today. Lower. Today it is everybody. Yes. You said that you could <clears throat> put, you had, you had only five year mortgages and you had to put 50% down instead of a 30 year with uh, zero putting down. zero mortgages. down, right. And, uh, so the average person, the, the, a young couple, a kid out of college and his wife, uh, they couldn't buy a house back exactly. then unless they got assistance from their parents or something instead of a bank. Uh, and today... And assistance from the government. The government not only guarantees most mortgages now... Nowadays, But, yeah. but they, now you can do it for zero down, and, and, and that allows people to buy something that they really can't afford. So, so a lot of people are going to get in trouble. And Yeah, so the, I think it's much more than the $100 trillion that you said. I think it's... it's I yeah, think your like, estimate I you, I'm, is conservative. I'm conservative there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but but for most people, the you know deflation is going to hit all your financial assets, um, and for the everyday person, it's going to hit their home. People do, up until two thousand eight and nine, people didn't think real estate could go down. Well, it went down, and. I always tell people, when people used to tell me real estate can't go down, I said, well, pick up your phone and call anybody at random in Tokyo. Real estate yeah. in Japan went down 60%, and now, 24 years later, it's still down 60%. It never came back, because not only was it bubbled up and had to deflate back down to some affordability, but Japan has something that I pointed out that nobody gets, in that because the next generation is substantially smaller than the baby boom that bought all those houses that drove them up, even when the young generation comes back and starts buying houses, it should drive up prices, except in Japan, just like they have more adult diapers selling than baby diapers for the first time in history, they have more old people dying than young people buying houses, Dyer, buyers or uh, are, are sellers. So, you know, people have to look at your real estate and say, look, you, you should have real estate if you're going to live it forever or if you can rent out positive cash flow. If you think you're going to get rich off real estate in your lifetime, probably not going to happen. But, but that deflation, who's that a benefit to? All the, the young generation coming up is going to be able to afford a decent house again without mortgaging themselves to the hilt. So deflation has very positive effects long term, but it is the most painful thing that can happen to the economy to your company you work for or your company you own or to your own mm -hmm. financial assets. I mean, it is a reset. It's a, you know, the yeah. river's here and then it goes off a waterfall. Now it's here. That's right. where your assets are going to be. They're going to go from here to here. And that's what happened in the 1930s. Um, you know, you talked about Japan. And one of the things that I'm amazed at is for more than 20 years now, they've proven that Keynesian economics doesn't work. They've tried to print their way, their way to prosperity. They've tried. They've they've uh, had government policies that kept these zombie banks yep. alive. Uh, they didn't let deflation happen and the debt clear. They didn't let the reset happen. Exactly. Right. And so here they are fighting it now. That it's since the since 1989, uh, they've been fighting this thing and keeping their economy in this really stagnant, low level. Uh, I, I, we recently went to Australia, China, and then Japan. It was really interesting. Flying to Australia, uh, you land in the year 2000, and you don't realize this until you fly to China and you land like in Shanghai or Beijing, and you land in 2014 or 2015. You land in today, basically, uh, 2016, if people are watching this next year. Uh, and then you fly to Japan and you land in the late 80s. Yeah. All of the buildings, frozen, the yeah. roads, everything is just stuck in time, just like the United States is stuck in time in the, uh, when the NASDAQ bubble popped. <clears throat> and people don't realize it until they see a comparison like Shanghai. It's, it's very interesting that all these government policies that uh, won't let the deflation happen and won't let the debt clear, uh, that that... Uh, we just get frozen in time and we keep on fighting it and our prosperity would actually be much higher had they let the free no, market work. We would have been over this crisis. We'd have been over the deflation by now if they'd have let it happen. And they could have done it in a civilized way. They, governments could actually help restructure debt, help facilitate the restructuring rather than have a collapse, force it in a violent way. That's what happened in the 30s. Everything just fell apart. So, so we had a natural reset. You could actually do it more constructively. 
They don't. And, and what I say about Japan, I call it the coma economy. They did not have a crisis like the Great Depression. Banks didn't fail, because the governments didn't let it. But the price they paid for that, they're in a coma economy forever. Mm -hmm. They're barely alive. The reset would have reinvigorated them. I, I call this deflationary period the winter season. And, and, and what Japan has proven now, this, this winter season rarely lasts more than 10 to 15 years. And, and the worst deflation rarely lasts more than a couple of years. But because they didn't allow this reset, if you don't go through winter, you don't get to spring. Japan's new generation should have already brought them into spring. They're ahead mm -hmm. of us on this whole baby boom curve, boom and bust curve. So that's the price. They're, they're paying a huge price. They don't realize, they say, well, we never had a crisis. Well, the price is you never grow again, ever. They have zero inflation. They've had zero GDP growth on, on average, zero everything. They are mm -hmm. in a coma, stagnation. They are frozen, just like you said. So, so I, I am very worried what central banks are doing because they've taken over the economy. They set short-term rates at zero. They set the treasury bonds, 10-year, 30, at zero, adjusted for inflation. It's, it's free money. Free money will always be abused. But when you set those prices of risk-free bonds, everything is set off that. The whole financial system, mortgages are set off that. Uh, stocks are 10 years earnings projection adjusted back to present for the 10-year treasury bond yield. The lower that is, the higher those stocks will be valued. This is creating a bubble mm -hmm. and, and, and inflating this whole thing. And, and the bigger the bubble you create, and history's crystal clear on this, and it's the law of physics, equal and opposite reaction. I don't know if it's the first law, the third law, but the greater the bubble, the greater the burst. So, so everybody's telling me, oh, Harry, what's the problem? The government, we averted a, a Great Depression. Hey, we're, we're growing at 2% and blah, blah, blah. We're doing better than Europe. We're doing better than Japan. I'm like, the problem is we're going to have a bigger bubble and a bigger disaster right. because governments are, will not take the consequences for the debt they help create. And, and governments have guaranteed everything you can guarantee. Mortgages, all bank deposits are guaranteed. Almost all mortgages. Now companies are guaranteed. Nobody can fail. No banks can. When you guarantee an economy and you create free money, you're going to have misinvestment, malinvestment, speculation, and greater and greater bubbles until the whole yeah. thing falls apart. Money cost for a reason. And, and if, you're, if you're fueling things by free money and or by endless debt, that has never, ever been sustainable in history. So this is, this to me, and most people are feeling better about the economy. Every year we grow, every another thousand, two thousand points, the Dow or the stock market goes, I'm like, we're going to pay a bigger price. I'm getting exactly. scared. Uh, and in fact, I may have to move somewhere yeah. a little safer. That's how scared <laughs> I'm getting. You know, um, it's interesting that they keep on proving that what they're doing doesn't work. Alan Greenspan created the real estate bubble yeah. by not allowing debt to clear and deflation to happen when the NASDAQ crashed in right. 2000. And so that, that bubble was created. So the crash of 08 was created by Greenspan. It's a That's direct right. causality. Had nothing to do with that. He just kept and it going. And same exactly. With they just keep yeah. it going. Well, Bernanke, uh, his reaction to that crisis of 08 is going to create this next yes. crash that's Great right around the corner. Exactly. Right. And, um, and, and it will always be worth, you know, again, it, it is like the classic drug addict. You, know, you can, if you're coming down off a high, what, what's your cure? You take more. Well, how long can you do that before your system breaks down? So, so it, there's no question in my mind, this next crash, this next downturn, and the deflation that will finally come up with it when people finally realize you can't inflate forever. Uh, because, because, I mean, imagine the central bankers around the world that we have a bigger crash than we had before, bigger deflation, and they turn around and say, oh, you know what, we just didn't print enough money. We're going to double down. Do you think most people would say, oh, sure, if it, if it didn't work and created a greater crash, then I think people are going to say, no, no, this doesn't make sense. The next downturn, the next crash can only be significantly stronger than the last mm -hmm. one. So it'll be worse than 2008, 9, especially when it comes to financial assets. I mean, I, I, I absolutely know, agree. It, yeah. And, and in fact, if you look historically in this kind of winter season where you get deflation only once in a lifetime, that's why people don't understand it. Um, it is typical for stock markets to go down 80 to 90 percent before they bought it. It's not like the 70s or, or other 
deep recessions where they go down 50% or 60% or even like 2008. 80 to 90% is what you would expect. And guess how much Japan's stock market went down when it bubbled? 80%. Despite endless QE, still went down 80%. And Japan's real estate went down 60%. That nobody in this country a few years ago mm -hmm. and few people even now think that real estate could go down 60% and really not come bouncing back as usual. This is exactly what demographics, exactly what history would say is going to happen. Uh, that this scenario is exactly what I've been betting on for years. I'm I'm trying to turn it to my advantage if I can. But what do you see that people could do about it? Because the, this is the uh, thing: is it's deflation is harder to make plans for than inflation or hyperinflation. Even it's it's uh, a different type of wealth transfer that's very difficult with for people to deal with. Uh, so what, what are you doing about it? Well, you know, basically you have booms and busts, but you have inflationary busts like the 70s and you have deflationary busts like the 30s. They are totally different. They're, mm -hmm. they're still bust. The economy slows down, people lose jobs, businesses go under. But in deflation, everything gets reset. So, so there's a number of things you do. The simplest thing to do and to sleep well at night is simply say, we've had a great bubble in real estate, great bubble in stocks and all financial assets. I'm going to cash out, have my money safe, and wait for the next burst. This is what Joseph Kennedy did in the early 30s. He sold stocks near the top when his shoeshine boys started telling him what stocks to pick. I remember in 1999, taxi drivers were telling me which NASDAQ stocks to buy. Right. I'm saying, okay, this is close. You get out of the top, stocks go down, let's say 80%, the typical. Now you buy those same stocks and companies at 20 cents on the dollar. That's how you get rich overnight. People think, oh, but I'm in cash or I'm in safe bonds and I'm not making any return. Your return is on the deflation because mm -hmm. everybody else is going to lose their assets in that deflation. You're going to be buying those assets when they deflate uh, because nobody's going to lend you money. Yeah. If you don't have cash or liquid money or, or safe bonds, something you can liquidate, you're not going to be able to take, you're going to see uh, the vacation home of your dreams, you know, in the Hamptons, and it's going to be 10, 20 cents on the dollar, and you're not going to be able to buy that bargain. Or same thing, you know, Apple yeah. stock, your favorite company, you know Apple's going to survive this. A, a lot of this reset is to, to shift market share to the most efficient and, and best focused companies long term. Well, those, Apple's going to come out of this screaming. So will Samsung. There's a lot of companies you can say, these companies will survive. What if you could buy Apple? 80% off. How much money are you going to make on that long term? So, so that's the simplest thing. You know, the, the most complicated thing, the flip side, you bet on things going down. The, the good thing, bubbles go up much faster than normal markets. And most bubbles build over five to six years in stocks and use typically more like 10 years for real estate. The trick is they burst much faster. They burst two to three times as fast as they build. So, if somebody realizes things have to go down and you don't get crazy and get leveraged and try to be a fancy trader or something, if you just say, well, I'm going to take some part of my portfolio and I'm going to bet on stocks going down. And you just sit on it. You don't have leverage. You don't get stopped out or anything, get margin call. And if, if we're right in the next, my indicators particularly point down in the next five years, you know, from, from uh, 2015 into early 2020. And you just say, okay, I'm just going to be short some stock index, could be the S&P, the NASDAQ, whatever. If I could short anything, I'd short Germany. Germany's gone nuts and they've got the worst demographics of any country in the world, just like Japan in the 90s. Just sit on it and when stocks go down, you've made money. Down is up for you. Right. Now most people, oh, I don't short stocks, so it's down. Well, just do it a little bit. So, so there's this whole spectrum of get safe and just be in liquid safe bonds or, or, or cash. Uh, and guess what? Uh, the dollar went up in the last crisis in 2008, not down, went up 27%. I think it's going to go up 40% or more. The dollar will go up in the deflationary stage. And then I'm kind of agnostic about the dollar. I think the dollar probably more go down after that. But the dollar is the safe haven. We're talking about destroying financial assets and loans. There are more dollar denominated financial assets and loans, 40% more than euros three to four times more than yen, yuan, and everything else. When we destroy all this money, more dollars are going to be destroyed than other currencies. So for a short period of time, the dollar will appreciate. Then, God knows what happens in the currency markets, because it, there is going to be a major reset mm -hmm. there. Uh, but 
people could be in the dollar to hedge, or you can have some part of your portfolio short things that are going to go down. And, and uh, one of the things I get when, especially when I debate people who are, are more on, on, on the gold bug camp, a lot of people listen to me and then listen to Peter Schiff and say, well, you're both right about the crisis. You're both right about debt. You both make sense. But he's saying do this, and I'm saying do that. I'm saying deflation. He's saying inflation comes first instead of deflation. I'm like, I can tell you what, if you're not 100% sure about that, the one thing that goes down in an inflationary crisis or a deflationary crisis is stocks. Real estate will go up in an inflationary crisis. Commodities will go up. Gold and silver mm -hmm. are the king in an inflationary crisis. Stocks go down either way. They just go down more. In the, I mean, stocks went down 89% at worst in the 30s, and, the, and adjusted for inflation, they were down 60-some percent in the 70s. So it's worse. So I tell people, decide your risk tolerance and, and take some portion of your portfolio and just be short stocks. I, I think right here in 2015 uh, you know, is, is a good time. The old things, they say sell in May and go away. I think mm -hmm. this May may be a darn good time to sell stocks. Or sell in May and go away for the rest of the decade. <laughs> well, in this case, yes. I, I, in this case, I'd say for five years. But most of the time, if you sell at the beginning of May and buy back in the second or third week of October, if you did that consistently over time, your returns would be way higher than somebody sitting in the S&P 500. And right. your risk would be way lower because most of the corrections, and it doesn't happen every year, but most of the serious corrections happen in the second half of the year. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> You said that the dollar is the safe haven. Uh, you know that's where everybody during runs the to. deflationary. And I do agree that the dollar is probably going to go up, uh, and I, I believe that we are going into deflation. The one area that we'll have to agree to disagree is precious metals. Uh, I see that as another safe haven. It is the other safe haven, and this time we're in for a currency crisis, in my opinion. I do think that you could see gold go under 1,000. You could see it go down to 700 or something like that. But that's going to be the paper gold. The last time that gold uh, took a dip under 1,000, you couldn't get any physical. And if you did, you were paying more for it than if, if you had bought it when it was 1,100. Uh, uh, it was, um, there, there, you know, I was a dealer, or I am a dealer, and there were tremendous shortages back then. Uh, for uh, over a, uh, a month, our only gold product was kilo bars. So the cheapest thing we had was like $30,000. Uh, there was uh, uh, three days where we couldn't get any product. We were out of business for three days. Uh, and everything we did have was selling for tremendous premiums over spot. So even though uh, the precious metals uh, fell dramatically uh, during the crisis of 08, uh, the actual physical price to buy and get a bar that you can hold in your hand or a coin uh, pretty much stayed flat or went up during that point when the, uh, the COMEX, the futures, the paper, gold and silver, were falling dramatically. Now, will that happen again? I don't know. I do have, uh, my portfolio used to be almost all precious metals, and it still is mostly precious metals, but I have a higher cash balance than I used to have. I'm keeping a lot more cash. I also keep emergency food, yeah. and um, I bought, uh, you know, I've never been a gun person, but I did buy a couple of 9 millimeters and a 12-gauge shotgun, and, and you said in one interview that uh, shotgun shells yeah. might make a good currency. Shotgun shells and little bourbon bottles. Who wouldn't those, want that in a crisis? Like those, you know? <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, these food pouches of emergency food, oh, absolutely. I think those might end up being a major currency, and I think... Um, that we're definitely headed for something that is going to be a topsy-turvy thing that people will not be able to figure out because yeah. nothing like it has happened to them in their in lifetimes. their lifetimes. Nobody saw the and, 1930s that's alive today, or maybe a few people, and they can't even remember. I mean, yeah. it, nobody right. is going to see this coming. No, nobody. How many people think well, of the 60s? How many people it, saw the inflation coming and, and yeah. gold doing so well? Nobody saw that coming until it happened. Nobody's going right. to see this, and this is going to be more destructive to financial assets in particular than the 70s was, than inflation was. Deflation, in fact, sometimes when I'm arguing with, with people who, um, you know, see hyperinflation instead of deflation or see inflation out of this instead of deflation, it's kind of like governments should be punished for printing this money. Yeah. It's like a moral argument. And I'm like, wait a minute, you want to punish governments? Deflation is a way worse punishment than inflation. 
Would you rather have been in the early 1930s or the mid 1970s? You know, uh, I'm telling you, the 30s were way worse than the 70s. Anybody living there would have told you that. So deflation yes, that was is, is because a huge of, consequence. That was because of all the credit that was created during Absolutely. the 20s. It was a during consequence. During the bubble. It was a consequence of printing. Consequence so, of, uh, and, and most of the printing, people think governments are printing money. Governments set rules and regulations that allow banks to print money. Most of the right. money is printed by private banks. And again, at the top of the last debt bubble in 2008, we had 10 trillion in federal government debt. We had 42 trillion in private debt. So, so, and it is the private debt, especially the debt that leverages financial institutions, and that was the biggest component of the private debt, more than corporate, more than household. That is what deleverages the fastest. We didn't have that factor. We didn't have Freddie Mae and Fannie Mac, government back, you know, agency mortgages and all this sort of stuff. Um, so yes, we created way more debt. Our, our total debt ratios at the top of this last bubble were more than twice what they were in 1929. And 1929 was followed by the Greatest Depression in U.S. and world history. So imagine how big a downturn you could yeah. have when, we, when we're coming to this with twice as much debt. And on top of that, governments have created money out of thin air on top of that. So it, it's, it's, people should be, you know, I don't want to be alarmist, but people should be scared. And, and you should yes. be serious about studying what happens in deflation. And, you know, my, my difficulty with gold is that it's been manipulated for almost all of history. So it started trading freely in the early 70s. And so I can look at everything else, real estate, stocks, commodities, and say, what happens when there's deflation? I can look back at history. Gold, I don't have a, a way to say, yeah, we only I have... think at times gold's going to go up and times it's going to go down in this deflation because it is a crisis metal. And it is something people have confidence in it's real. But, but we only have one cycle to look at. You don't have, well, right, because well, it was all made... all we have is a very brief cycle in 2008. I mean, gold well, only I mean, went I mean, down the 70s, for a couple months and then the, went back up. The 70s bull market and then to 2000. That, but that wasn't deflation. Now, I right. tell you, there is no question that gold does well in the yeah. inflation. And not a gold, well, I've got a know, chart that shows yeah. the correlation between gold and inflation is almost... In the perfect. 30s, though... Um, uh, the, the process of gold going from uh, $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce was a month and a half of unpegging and exchange rates would yeah. fall. And so the dollar was, was sinking, basically, compared to gold, and then they would repeg every day. It wasn't just... Roosevelt, yes, he, had, he was given the power by Congress to devalue the dollar up to 50% uh, against gold. So uh, he, would be, he would be able to double the... He was allowed to raise the price to $40 an ounce. And they unpegged, they, de they repegged, they unpegged, they repegged. And over a month and a half, it was this slow sinking of the dollar and gold going from $20.67 an ounce to 35. But the fact that it wasn't uh, just a signature and suddenly it's 35, that it was actually the global markets uh, causing uh, this thing. To me, that bodes well for gold in a deflation. Uh, that the last, the only great deflation that we can look to that's really well studied. I mean, I've, met, I've read Murray Rothbard's America's Great Depression, uh, Milton Friedman's Monetary History of the United States from 1867 to 1960, which half was uh, about the Great Depression, and Ben Bernanke's essays on the Great Depression. I'm probably the only, you know, I'm considered a gold guy. I'm really more of a cycles guy. I'm not a gold bug. I'm in gold right now because of the beliefs that I've developed uh, being a cycles guy. And mm -hmm. you're a cycles guy I, and a demographics, I primarily, I, a demographics I, guy I was a like I've never guy seen. before I was a demographic expert. Oh, really? Okay. Demographics is just one of the most useful cycles I stumbled on. And, and it's useful because I can mm -hmm. project it in the future. I know exactly when people are going to spend money, exactly what they're going to do by age in any consumer category yeah. overall, when they're going to invest, save. But no, I, I'm, I'm definitely a cycle guy. But gold rose 70% uh, uh, nominally in the Great Depression. And then purchasing power went way up. The, the uh, prices fell by 30%. So it, it more than doubled in purchasing power during the Great Depression. Will it this time? I don't know. That's no guarantee. There was, you know, the, the government had it manipulated. Gold was still $20.67 an ounce like it had been before yeah. World War I, and they had inflated and gone from uh, a billion dollars worth of uh, national debt before World War I to 25 billion by the end. 
and uh, the you know we had had established the uh, Federal Reserve and pumped the currency supply. Base money had grown from being uh, just gold to gold plus Federal Reserve notes and and uh, with a just a forty percent reserve. So um, uh, the growth of the and that caused the that you know the base money growing. Allows the banks to then do the fractional reserve lending that caused exactly. the Roaring Twenties, that caused the it, bubble, it, it that caused the crash. It is not an accident crash, that right. the greatest depression in history followed the creation of the Federal Reserve. Right. Because what the Federal Reserve sees as its task is to prevent recessions, as if you should prevent recessions, as if you should cure. I don't want a cure for the common cold. Colds help your body get rid of stuff. It's not something to get rid of. Recessions create efficiency and innovation. You get the greatest efficiency and innovation in recessions, not in booms. So what the Federal Reserve did, we had a very volatile markets in late 1800s, early 1900s. We said, we need somebody to tame this thing. So they tamed it, which means what they're doing today, even they're doing more today. Every time you have a recession or slowdown, or something, you, you pump more money. You pump more money, you get more debt, you get more leverage, and you create a bubble, and then it burst. And so we've had depressions before in the United States, 1870s, 1880s, 90s, 1830s, mm -hmm. and early 40s. Never one as bad as the Great Depression. Because right. the Fed came in and tried to make the economy better rather than letting the economy run itself. The economy is the dynamic opposites of democracy and capitalism, you know, and boom and bust and inflation and deflation. You need all these seasons. I mean, everything has seasons to it. I'm a cycle guy. Everything I study, including climate back as far as one, has seasons. So. Seasons were not created by accident. It's a fundamental part of life. The seasons help facilitate change, progress, and innovation. And our standard of living goes up because of it. So when governments come in like the Fed did initially in the early 1900s, and now central banks are doing globally on a scale that the Fed couldn't even imagine in their land, they're killing the golden goose. That's what they're killing, free market capitalism, mm -hmm. which is how we got rich in the first place. So I am like not only saying, tell, warning people about this reset and saying, you can see this coming, it, it, it's inevitable, you can do something about it, you can prosper instead of get annihilated by it. But I'm like, I want this reset to happen. If we don't get this reset, we're going to be like Japan in a coma economy forever. We're going to mm -hmm. die as a country. The whole Western world's going to die. So, so this is, uh, you don't mess with Mother Nature from my point of view. You facilitate right. it. And they're but they have with messed Nature. so much. Oh, and unbelievable. Uh, the, when the reset starts to happen, they will try to prevent oh, it. Absolutely. And uh, we, the, the, it looks like the leaders that we're going to have uh, you know, through the next elections will be even more socialist than we have right now, and uh, potentially. And what, I'm, what really worries me uh, isn't the reset, it's uh, the reset trying to happen government rushing and in to them, save yeah, us them and and then uh, deciding that because all of this stuff is imploding that would they have to share the wealth that they've got that that we have to uh, go down this road that has never worked there isn't an example in history of I mean if socialism worked the Soviet Union would have been the exactly. winner exactly. in the cold China world. is still a top-down driven economy government planning which has proved not to work and, and I've been telling people you talk about a bubble. We're, we're nowhere compared to China. Right. China is the greatest bubble, the most government-pushed, manipulated, leveraged bubble in all of modern history. China is not going to see a soft landing. They're going to fall like an elephant. And, yeah. and, and, and I think we're going to have some civil unrest and a lot of problems here. But I tell you, I, I, you couldn't get me in China for a billion dollars. They, they are really going to have problems. And this is what happens when governments mess with Mother Nature, mess with natural cycles. You can facilitate them but you can't manipulate them and try to prevent them. And that's what they're doing. This is extremely uh, dangerous stuff. And, and I'm hoping for two things. My cycle suggests, again, 2015 to early 2020 is all four of my long-term cycles. And, and they're very comprehensive. All point down for the same time like they did in the early 30s and the mid, mid, uh, early to mid 70s. Um, so that says it's gonna happen in the next five years. But the most dangerous time looks like 2015 to 16. I'm hoping, number one, that we start to have the next financial crisis before the 2016 election. So maybe we elect somebody that looks like they could be a turnaround manager instead of another, you know, endless money printer. Well, that's one of the problems, thing. though, is, is we don't elect people that have any business experience. 
what we elect. Jan Janet is, Yellen, Ben Bernanke. Right. Have they ever run a business? No. Um, They've never hired anybody. They, they studied right. the Great. Ben Bernanke studied the Great Depression. Yes, I read his books and, and I, I read it. all his white papers and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Now, now the other thing I'm hoping for is that when this next crisis comes, and I think it's sooner than later, um, that I'm hoping the people of most countries, or particularly the United States, I'm hoping people are smart enough to say, "You already did this. You already tried to print your way out of the last deflation or depression or." or, or failure of our economy, yeah, but if they and all he did was smart. create a bigger bubble, all it did was burst bigger, we're not going to let you do it again. We're, we're going to be against it. Now, I don't know if that's going to happen or not. But it hasn't I'm happened in Japan in 25 years. In Japan. <laughs> <laughs> so. but, but, you know, Japan is unique, though, in a way, because they went through their great reset, their bubble burst, their real estate and stocks and their endless reset. They went through it when the rest of the world was having the greatest boom in history. And I was, I tell you, I was, my this is what credit, scares me, is they had us to sell to during that no, that's whole what I'm time. Saying. Their export machines were running yeah. at full tilt. Right. That made it a lot easier. They didn't have the spill off of a world crisis coming in their economy like, like everybody had in the Great Depression. So they were able to do this, and, and they have been on quantitative easing forever. And, and it hasn't worked, except that it's kept the banking system from falling down. So I, my theory is I don't think... It is possible that the whole Western world just goes into this coma economy and just keeps printing and keeps doing all this stuff. I think people will say something's wrong because I think most people know that you don't get something for nothing and that when governments just, whenever there's a problem, they just create money and throw it. I mean, people got to be sitting there saying on one side, yeah, something for nothing. There's, there's something wrong about this. On the other hand, they're like, yeah, but we didn't have a great downturn. I still got my job and, you know, and, and the economy turned around. I'm hoping that people say no, and the Germans say nine, and on and on. We'll see. I don't know if people. I don't think they will because that average person that could say no has a mortgage. They are the leveraged out people that are going underwater. to lose everything. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the Great Depression, uh, it was anybody that had debt lost everything they had. They lost the family farm. They, and the farmers they, were the hardest hit. And, yeah. and you know what? I think this would be the Well, the farmers were the ones that could borrow they currency could borrow because they their could land and their equipment and their their crop cycle. Crop. They would borrow every single year uh, for, to replant and grow the crops, and then they'd pay it back once they harvested. And so uh, they were carrying debt when the deflation hit. Yeah. And so that's one of the reasons that they were the hardest hit. Yeah. Well, you know that a lot of people don't get it. I think it's going to be the opposite this time. Back then, it was the local smaller banks that, that got hit from the farm loans and all mm -hmm. this stuff. And, and those are the ones that went under. This time it's going to be the big banks. Because the, the ones big that are banks most highly leveraged. have backed and done all these leverage and done all these mm -hmm. mortgages and stuff and, 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 and all these financial securities and stuff. They're going to be the ones. It is going to be Citibank and Bank of yeah. America and J.P. Morgan and all these. And, and, and the government, basically, they won't quite say this. Their major motive for this endless money printing has simply been to save the banks. And the Federal Reserve does not represent the people. It's not democratic like It right. basically represents the banks. And so they're saving the banks while killing anybody that saves money and, and creating this coma economy that can never really grow and innovate and reset. Uh, we, and it's not just the financial asset bubble. It doesn't benefit everyday people. have very little stocks and financial assets. Um, we have a health care bubble. We have an education bubble that's being fueled by this. Kids now have to get, you know, a dollars $150,000 student loan just to get a college degree. Mm -hmm. How are they ever going to make it on the top of the high cost of housing and, and older people health care and younger people education? How are they going to make it? So government's doing all these crazy things just to keep the banks from falling down. I'm saying let the banks fall down, restructure, and go forward. Did we, did we lose banking after the Great Depression? Did, you know... Did, did everything no, came we, back but we lost about ever. a third of the banks. Yeah. <laughs> a lot we lost a lot of banks, yeah. but the ones left, we lost a lot of companies. The one, ones less, are my motto from history and life, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Mm -hmm. People don't want, the problem with people is we're a bunch of sissies. Nobody wants challenge. Everybody wants the good stuff, the easy life. Everybody wants booms. Nobody wants bust. Life has to have both. Life does not work without boom and bust, inflation and deflation, male and female, and every opposite you can think of. Life is a play of opposites. Uh, light and dark, you know, sleep and work. I mean, you know, 
people want one side of it and not the other. Mm -hmm. And if you think that way, you are not going to be as successful as you could be, and you're not going to see these cycles coming. There are cycles, and there have always been cycles. And some people say to me, oh, cycles are, are, are bunk, or, or, or we don't have, we're not going to have recessions in the future. I said, you're crazy. There have always been cycles. If you don't believe in and study cycles, you're going to miss a lot of stuff. It's that simple, because cycles always agree. happen. And, and, and the cycle we see most is, is you get, you come out of a deflation or reset, you have a boom with mild inflation, I call that spring, then you have a bust with high inflation and, and very low productivity. That's what we had in the late 60s, 70s, and early 80s. And then you have a bubble boom with disinflation, and disinflation is always followed by deflation before you go back to inflation. So anybody that um, says the we're gonna go from inflation to disinflation back to inflation first, no, you have to go through deflation. Disinflation uh, encourages debt. It encourages and speculation. Yes, Both. right. It encourages exactly. lack of savings uh, because you get re it's it's the Federal Reserve conditioning everybody uh, to uh, use their house as an ATM simply because five years from now you're going to be able to refinance again at a lower rate and take more cash out. Well, well here's what kills me, Mike. Is that in, in, when you get into this fall disinflationary right. bubble boom season, I call it, naturally this will happen. Just falling interest rates encourages more borrowing. Falling interest rates pushes up everything from real estate to, to uh, stocks and, and financial assets. This is happening now. This will happen. You'll get a bubble anyway. When governments step in and, and stimulate and lower bubble. interest rates even lower, you get a bigger bubble. Yeah. Why? This is already going to happen anyway, and governments just make it worse. The government made the 20s more of a bubble than it needed to be, and they made the 90s and 2000s more of a bubble. And now they're trying to keep the bubble going forever, which is the, the, the lamest insanity, thing I've ever heard insanity, of. Yeah. How, who could possibly think you could keep a bubble going forever? And why would you want to? In a bubble, the rich get richer and the everyday person gets crucified. That's what's happened already. Wages for everyday people have gone nowhere. In fact, they're down in the last 20 some years. Mm -hmm. Rich people are, get, are, are doing better than ever. Why would governments were supposed to come and, and the capitalist system already favors rich people and innovative people and people take risks, and they should. The government's supposed to keep some balance and say, look, this has to work for everybody. That's what democracy is the opposite of capitalism. Most people say, oh, this is like brother and sister. No, they're opposite. It's like male and female. Right. Um, it balances the capitalist system. That's why we've done so well when, when, when Sally met Harry, I call it. In the late 1700s, democracy emerged, especially in the United States as the model. And the Industrial Revolution really created free market capitalism and, and Adam Smith and all of that theory. He was the first true economist that understood the dynamics, the play of opposites of free market capitalism. No economist I see today even remotely understands that. If they'd ever run a business, ever had sex or anything, they would understand. They don't understand it. <laughs> and I really said, I mean, Yellen, nice person, Ben Bernanke, smart person. I met Alan Greenspan. He's, he's actually an economist who's funny. Um, and, and has a sense of humor, but these people don't understand our economy at all. You can know a lot about something and not understand the actual dynamics. They are killing the golden goose here. And that's the worst thing that I fear. I'd rather have the worst reset in history than be in a coma economy forever and just basically die. And that's what Japan has chosen. I don't think the whole world can choose that option. I think Japan could choose it because they had it to themselves. In a good and they had us though. to export to. And right? had us to export yeah. to. The whole world goes down. We're all going to affect each other's economies. The Great Depression, trade shrank for everybody, and everybody put up tariffs and made it worse. Like mm -hmm. you say, government reactions are almost always wrong. Mm -hmm. In the end, if you look at history, no government's big enough to offset the entire free market system in the world. It's bigger. Mother Nature's bigger than us. The free market capitalist system is bigger than any central bank. So the central banks are going to lose this battle, and you just got to know, I mean, they're winning it right now. They're inflating just enough to stave off this crisis. At some point, something's going to go wrong. The China bubble bursts. Germany, I'm telling people, just we predicted the demise of Japan in the late 80s. People said impossible. They're, they're the greatest country in the world. We said Japan's going down. Purely demographics and bubble. Germany's got the worst demographics of any country in the world in the next eight years. Nobody sees Germany fall. Germany's going to fall on demographics alone, and they're holding the Eurozone together. Without Germany, mm -hmm. they're nothing. Right. So, so something's going to go wrong, and these, <clears throat> these 
clueless central bankers are going to lose control and this reset's going to happen. So you need to, you need to sit down and say, what do I do to protect my business, my family, my financial assets? Where, even where, where you live is important. I want to be in as safe a place as possible. You can do stuff now to be ahead of this and be positioned right when this happens because this is inevitable. You cannot keep a bubble going forever and you cannot prevent deflation forever. You can't save it off forever. When it happens, like you said earlier, a small percentage of people are going to make a fortune and do very well and most people are just going to not know what hit them. They just be walking around on days. What happened? My, my house went down 60%. I'm underwater my mortgage. I can't refinance. Blah, blah, blah. I lost my job. All my neighbors lost my jobs. My kids can't get a job and they're all moving in my house and, you know, and all their friends are, you know, people are just going to be like, what happened? Well, history's crystal clear what happens when a bubble boom bursts. Crystal clear. Deflation, reset of debt, and reset of financial assets. That's what happens. So you can prosper from that if you see it coming. You're right. 90 some percent of people will not see this. coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the most important thing that people can do is study this as much as they can and try and figure it out for themselves. Yeah. 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 You have to, to make the type of changes we're talking about here to, you know, to go against the grain, you got to be damn convinced of this. That's what I tell mm -hmm. people. I mean, I said, you know, don't just, don't just read my book or, or listen to audio tape. You know, we put on a seminar, come to it. You need to be convinced of this. And you spend enough time with me, I'm telling you, you will be convinced. Uh, because we have history and the facts on our side. And when I argue against people who say otherwise, they're always talking ideology and they're always stretching the facts. Right. I have that all the time. A lot of people I argue with will agree on the, on the debt thing, the crisis, and will totally disagree about the deflation versus inflation side. And these people will throw out, and I have to say, well, that's not right. That's not right. No, that didn't happen. This is not the facts. I've studied the damn facts. I've studied yeah. history more than history professors have in as back far as you want to go. I'm on, I don't tell people how far back I study history. They, they tell me I should get a girlfriend, you know, sort of thing. But, <laughs> you know, but history repeats itself. And, and it's crystal clear what happens. So, so if you see this, you can do the right thing. And it's very clear. It's not, not One complicated. One thing I see in history is that... Um, the public does never gets rewarded for mass stupidity. And if everybody is leveraged out to the max, and everybody's doing something. then you don't go straight into inflation. That has never happened in history that I can see where the public wins at the expense of the banks. Exactly. Uh, and so when everybody's leveraged out, the thing that has to happen is deflation. It's, it's whatever. Um, it's like uh, <clears throat> the majority in the stock market uh, has to be wrong eventually. Otherwise, markets don't work and there's no opportunity. Um, markets peak, not, not only when trends like demographics or, or, or a debt bubble or something peaks. And I mean, basically, we're way past peak debt. Nobody needs to borrow anymore. Everybody's in debt. But they all bubble, bubbles in, in stock bull markets also in when all the investors have piled in. So you're right. When, when most people have piled in, you are talking the great majority and they are going to be wrong because there's mm -hmm. nobody left to buy after them. Right. The last people to get in are what they call, I hate to call it, the dumb money. Mm -hmm. The, and, and the so, bag holders. <laughs> yeah. So when that happens, even if, I mean, 1987, you had a 40% correction in the stock market. There was no recession. There was no slowdown in the economy, nothing. It's just the stock market had been down for a long time. That all of a sudden started going up. Everybody piled in, and then it went down just because everybody piled in. Now we're talking about everybody's piled in and hedge funds and financial institutions are leveraged 30 to 50 to one with zero cost money almost. And, and, and the fundamentals of demographics, the fundamentals of, of excessive debt and, and financial leverage are all negative. I mean, so this, this mm -hmm. is, I, I tell people with high confidence, the next several years will be the worst economic and financial crisis you will see in your lifetime or that maybe even in your kids' lifetimes, but certainly in your lifetime, you will not see something like this. So what you do today is, is more important than any time in your life because wealth does disappear much faster yeah. than it bubbles up. I've been telling people that this is coming for about a decade now, and I call it the greatest crisis in the history of mankind. This is the greatest wealth transfer that there has ever been in history because a crisis like this, I mean, um, the Great Depression was almost global. Yes, almost global. Uh, it, it affected the uh, advanced economies. Uh, 
this is, is going to be the first time that we have an economic event of, of this scale that is global and there isn't any place. And, you know, and, and you're right, you have a hyper emerging countries because yeah. emerging countries don't have the demographic decline that, that the wealthy countries do, but they are largely commodity exporters. You know, the biggest thing to collapse so far has been commodity prices, iron ore, steel, oil, mm -hmm. things like that, copper. I mean, we've been predicting this for years. Commodities run. I'm a cycle guy, you know, 30 year cycle like a clock. You know, 1920, 1950, 1980, and then just recently, 2008 and 11, in between. Commodities are plunging, and this kills emerging countries and their exports and their major companies. So this time, it's not going to be just the uh, developed countries going down like in the 30s. The emerging countries are going to feel this at first. Now, they're going to come out of it much better. And, and mm -hmm. I, I'm also And I would rather be in a country where their currency supply is mostly base currency and not yeah, exactly. all this credit, all the, the, the voodoo debt that uh, the banks create. And that is one. The emerging countries, since they have lower incomes, they never have the same. China is the only super high in debt emerging countries. Their debt ratios are a fraction of ours, India or Russia mm -hmm. or South Africa, countries like that. So that's an advantage for them. The emerging countries also have very strong demographics, except for China, coming out of this great reset. Uh, and, and, and also, this commodity cycle will turn back up. I'm predicting, I think the next commodity boom um, will be perhaps the strongest in history because the next global boom is going to be driven much more by emerging countries and their higher populations and their new middle class than emerging countries. Because we're, we're aging, except for a few small countries. We're aging. Um, and those emerging countries are much more commodity intensive. You know, India spends 60% of their, in, of their spending on commodities. You know, Chinese, 40%. We spend 10% maybe on commodities, something like that if you add it all up. So I think, you know, when I'm arguing with people in gold, and they say, well, gold could go to 5,000. I say, yeah, in the next boom. I think the, the next commodity cycle into about 2038 to 40 may be the strongest commodity cycle in history. And uh, emerging countries will benefit from that. Uh, developed countries don't like commodities going up because, you know, we import them, they export them. Mm -hmm. So they like high commodity prices. And in the 70s was great for emerging countries. So, so they, you know, there's a lot of dynamics, but, you know, it goes back to their cycles. There's cycles in debt, there's cycles in demographics, there's cycles in commodities, there's cycles. I have a geopolitical cycle that's really simple. 70 to eight, 17 to 18 years good and 17 to 18 years bad. Think about 1983 mm. to 2000. Did anything go wrong in the world in that time? We had a hundred hour war with Saddam Hussein, kicked him out of Kuwait and then said, we're not going to try to take over your country and restructure you and depose you. Mm -hmm. That's the worst thing that happened. Didn't and we invade Grenada too? <laughs> you, know, not, you know, no inflation, no global conflicts, the Cold War was winding down, everything was hunky-dory. Now you look at what, 2001, what happened there? 9-11. How's mm -hmm. the world been since 9-11? One failed war after the next. One civil war after the next, you know, one dictator doing this after the next. Um, and now we got ISIS on top of all that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that makes Al Qaeda look like nothing. So this is a negative geopolitical cycle. It's going to stay negative. It's a cycle until about 2020. And then all of a sudden the world's going to get better again and nobody's going to want. It's just a cycle. This cycle I've measured back 200 years. Hmm. So wouldn't it be nice to understand that? It's not just generation spending and not that's a very projectable cycle but but the geopolitical environment is, is goes through very clear cycles so people if people are just aware think of being a farmer and you didn't understand the seasonal cycle you knew nothing about it you had no idea when spring was going to come or, or when to harvest people learned that thousands of years ago and now it's a science nobody mm -hmm. argues about the tides nobody argues about spring and so it's just it may come a little early now. It's useful to understand cycles. That's why I, I'm into cycles above everything else. It, it's, to me, the most important thing to understand about the world because there's cycles in everything. So we agree on 99.9% .9 of everything that we've talked about with the exception of I lean a little bit more toward precious metals. I've got a little bit more cash, but precious metals. And I believe that ultimately uh, they'll come out doing well either way. Even if they go down, I believe it's going to be temporary. Like I said, we're, when it comes to the contraction of the currency supply, the deflation, we're like right here now. We're going to take this severe deflation. Uh, our monetary system, global monetary system, can't work in persistent deflation without the whole thing imploding. 
And the central bankers know that, and I think they're going to throw hundreds of trillions of dollars at it, and uh, that we could end up in either big inflation or, or even hyperinflation. Uh, and I believe that precious metals are a safe haven. But like you, I also have cash on the sidelines. So um, tell us your website, uh, tell us about some of your books, and uh, uh, you know, once again, tell people what you think they can do uh, in this deflation to protect themselves. Getting out of debt, too. Uh, I don't carry any debt. Do you carry any debt right now? I I only do on my vacation home. Um, I, I don't want to pay back a tax deductible, low interest mortgage loan. Any other debt I don't want. It's certainly not credit card debt or student loan debt if I was a younger person and that sort of thing. So no. I mean, people that have low debt and, and high liquidity are the people going to do well in this downturn. It, it, it's that simple. And you know, for more information for me, I have a free newsletter. Uh, it's called Economy and Markets. Um, you just go to harrydent.com, put in, in your website, you're on my newsletter. We have your um, email address. Yes. Yeah. Just all you put, put in your email address, you're on this free newsletter. It's daily, high content. You can get to know us. You, you can hear what we say about everything. And, and uh, we also have a, a website, dentresearch.com. Uh, my most recent book is The Demographic Cliff. It's going to come out in paperback in August of 2015. That's a great book because we're really focusing on this deflation season and that. But it's also useful. I tell people, go back and read my first published book, The Great Boom Ahead. It came out in late 1992. People go back and look at that book. We predicted the entire 90s, the fall of Japan, the, the great boom, the real estate bubble, all this stuff before Clinton got in office. or any, You know, politicians mm -hmm. think they caused it. It had nothing to do with them. So it, it just will allow you to see, you know, the cycles we study work. They make sense. I can't predict the short term. I can't predict exactly when this bubble is going to burst or exactly where the stock market is going to peak. But I can tell you the bubble is going to burst. And I can tell you when the danger periods. And so, so the demographic cliff, uh, for sure, reading. And, 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 if, and if you have time, go back and uh, you can still get it on Amazon. Get the great boom ahead. Excellent. Thank you so sure. much for your time. And uh, <laughs> good luck to you in the deflation. <laughs> well, deflation is going to do me well, I can tell you that. I'm, I am going to benefit, not be wiped out by it. I'm, that's something I'm confident of. I'm hoping for the same. Thanks. Thanks.